So welcome everyone to the last session of day nine of the Global Animals in Disasters uh, Conference. I'm Mel Taylor, one of the organising committee. The next session is going to be presented by our Associate Professor Stephen Galassi, who um, is going to talk about Do No Harm, a challenging conversation about how we prepare and respond to animal disasters. We're very pleased to have Steve with us. Um, he's been very involved, of course, in the whole conference. But if you're interested to read more about him and this presentation, if you go to the speaker bios and abstracts in our, um, on our website, you'll be able to read more there. Before we start, just some uh, housekeeping information. You'll find the Zoom chat feature has been disabled for this session. Uh, if you have any questions, please put those in the Q&A and we'll ask Steve these at the end. Um, we'd like to encourage you to use the hashtag GADMConf if you're on Twitter or social media. And at the end, when you exit, there'll be a short evaluation of the session. So please feel free to be as rude as you like. Um, and just as a reminder, we will be recording these sessions and editing them and making them all available uh, at our GADMAC award ceremony in July, which will coincide with our release of the Australian Journal of Emergency Management that runs alongside our conference. So without further delay, I'm going to give Steve the floor um, and over to you. Thanks, Mel. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Um, so our, my presentation today is around Do No Harm. Um, it's a conversation about how we do things better as a collective um, so that we can deliver better responses uh, and more sustainable responses to animals affected or impacted by, by disaster. Now, I'm going to be talking about doing no harm, and you may wonder what has the Blues Brothers got to do with do no harm? But there are a number of lessons that we can learn from the Blues Brothers, from Jake and Alwood, about how we can do things better. In the presentation today, I'm going to be covering, well, what is this do no harm concept? Um, how does it apply in the animal disaster response context? Um, how that we need to actually start addressing the root cause of why we're responding in the first place. And a new phrase that I'm calling the delegitimization of animal disaster rescue through suboptimal response, and some recommendations of how we can do things better in order to help animals impacted uh, by disasters. Now, for those that have been involved in the humanitarian space, the do no harm concept is a very well-known uh, philosophy and, and, and approach. It has its origins in the Hippocratic Oath, um, but it was really developed uh, more so by Mary Anderson in the 1990s for aid work, um, with a focus also around conflict situations, but it has evolved. It's evolved since the 1990s um, to be more than just conflict-sensitive situations. Um, but the, the issue with the do no harm philosophy is that it still is around people. It's still around, it's very human centric. So it's about exposing, to avoid exposing people to additional risks through our, our actions. So what do we mean by do no harm in the context of animal disaster management? Well, here's some examples. We can create dependency. If we keep responding, if we keep on deploying into areas, we create, potentially create a dependency in the sense that communities end up saying, we don't need to get ready or take any responsibility because X, Y, Z, NGO or country comes to our aid every time. And then we have something like COVID, where some of those external interventions are disrupted, and then that community is now more at risk because we've created this dependency. We also have, and for anyone involved in emergency management on large scale operations, you'll find, you'll, you'll find um, spontaneous or disastrous donations. So to give you uh, a bit of context around that, uh, Gerardo spoke the other day about the influx 
of uh, milk powder to Haiti. And the impact of that was it nearly decimated a fragile um, local dairy industry as a result. I've seen container loads of woolen jerseys turn up in Samoa, and these containers of donated goods clog up the system for legitimate aid. In Hurricane Harvey, the Humane Society there said that they had a second disaster with an overwhelming amount of, do of donations that clogged them up, including pallet loads of peanut butter for enrichment uh, toys. We can also, our actions can also absolve responsibilities of mandated agencies and owners and guardians. So again, I'll, I'll go back to uh, a New Zealand example, the Nelson fires. The National Civil Defence Emergency Management Plan mandates the local authority, the local council animal control to be responsible for the care, relocation or relocation um, and accommodation of companion animals. Now, if someone else steps in and provides that outside of the mandated process, without any pre-engagement, without any um, authority, then what, what's happening is those organisations will say, well, it's our responsibility, but we don't actually have to worry about it now because this organisation comes in. And that's fine until we have something like a, a large scale tsunami where that one organisation has no ability to scale up and provide a, a service you know, of that magnitude. No one does. That's why it's a disaster. It exceeds capacities. We need things that are also scalable and sustainable. So when we look at uh, emergency pet sheltering, for example, we know that animal-only shelters where uh, volunteers typically look after displaced animals on behalf of the um, animal's owner are significantly human resource intensive. They cost 25 times more than having cohabitation where owners maintain responsibility. It also can have a negative impact on local businesses. So if there's existing capacity in the community, use it. So an example would be, uh, again, it's happened in New Zealand, there was, a, there was an emergency where a local cattery that was fully air conditioned was made available for displaced animals that were owned. However, a temporary shelter was set up outside of the, the arrangements and the air conditioned cattery wasn't used because the organization wanted to establish their own shelter. As a result, animals were subjected to high temperatures and indeed one animal suffered from heat stress. So again, we've got to use local capacity. How do we build local resilience? Now also our interventions. Our interventions get measured, not just by the public, by, but by the emergency services. If we turn up, if you turn up, and you don't have the right equipment, the right gear, the right understanding of how emergency services and incidents operate. And Rachel Westcott made this point really well and clear that you have to have this training and operate within the system. If you don't, unfortunately what will happen is the next time there's a disaster, you, you and your organization may not be there, but the local organizations that do turn up get turned away because the last experience that those emergency services had with the animal people was less than ideal. We have to get local communities taking ownership because if we do have overwhelming events, no one organization will ever have the capacity to provide response. We have to have local communities. And in terms of lessons management, we've, we've, we've heard from many presenters about many operations, but where are the lessons, where are the after, after action reports? Because one, Sometimes they're not even done. And that's a basic accountability of any professional emergency response organization. But if they're not being shared, they are lessons denied. And those lessons denied have negative impacts on animal welfare. One of my favorite scholars is Sebastian Heath. 
and he wrote an article in 2015, and he made the comment, um, common to many of these issues is a weak animal health infrastructure because of chronic pressure from pet overpopulation. Unless this root cause is addressed, the communities remain vulnerable to similar challenges as they and others have faced in the past. This is all about, we can't just keep on responding and not address the core issue. Where there are existing issues in communities such as dogs being chained up, dogs without or animals without appropriate shelter, dogs that are not registered or animals that aren't registered, companion animals that aren't microchipped, these are all things that weaken the animal health infrastructure. And the weaker it is, the more vulnerable communities will be. We all have a role in advocating and being part of prevention and mitigation, not just response. And here's a small little video from the Blues Brothers for those that remember and may not remember. The band, Elwood! The band! The band? The band? The band? The band! So we're getting the band back together. We're getting the band back together. Now this has been brought up many a time where spontaneous mandates, where organizations that have minimal or no experience or training capacity qualifications in emergency response decide that they're gonna do emergency response on the day. We have the saying, if you wanna to come to play on Saturday, come to practice on Wednesday. Um, and you need to be part of the formal plans. Now you saw that with, um, uh, a number of pre presenters talking about their engagement with local plans, let it be the wildlife response plans, let it be the save them approach of making sure they're part and listed in those plans. But one of the barriers is that a lot of animal rehoming organisations call themselves animal rescue. And that's fine until we start to use that terminology around firefighters and emergency management. And actually it's not animal rescue. Because in the, in the era of no-kill shelters, what are you rescuing it from? And a lot of the, lot of the times, these organisations aren't really animal rescue, they're animal rehoming organisations. And that makes it really hard for the emergency services when they get a list of organisations offering help, and it's called XYZ Animal Rescue. Because they think, well, if it's animal rescue, these guys are, are, are animal rescue but actually it's not real animal rescue. And it's been, I've seen this a few times where there's been responses, but responding agencies have used pre-existing animal conditions and purporting them to be disaster, uh, arising from disaster impacts for the purposes of a um, profile or fundraising. Now, Unfortunately, that undermines the credibility of all of us. It undermines the trust that we have for emergencies with emergency services. So saying that these animals um, are all skinny from you know, the floods or whatever, but they were actually skinny the week before. They were chained up the week before. They had no kennels the week before. We'll go back to this Heath's weak animal health infrastructure. And in building resilience, we have to go back and we're all part of the mitigation and prevention. We can't just be selective and just turn up on the day for what is, for some people would say, what is the fun stuff. Now offering assistance is great, but make sure you match the capability with the need. If you are an animal rehoming organization and you've got a great fostering program, great, offer that. Don't say that you can send people in the field to go and rescue animals unless you've got the same training, equipment and capability of that of bona fide real animal rescue organisations. Now there's a number of case studies or photos I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna show. I'm not gonna identify the organisation or the people, but this is an example of an, a, um, a animal welfare organisation responding to um, um, a volcanic eruption area. Now, we can see here we've got what is um, 
looks like reasonably sort of basic PPE, but the thing that concerns me is again, turning up in t-shirts and synthetic lycra pants. Um, because unfortunately, Jake Mil Milbank was 19 and he was a tour guide on Fakari White Island in New Zealand, which erupted in 2019. And you'll see him, see him there. He's wearing that little um, very basic $20 um, helmet. He's got um, a t-shirt on and a pair of, pair of shorts. And this is what can happen. Pyroclastic flows around volcanic areas, the temperature can be anywhere between 200 and 700 degrees Celsius. So we have to make sure that when we're turning up, we've got the right PPE. This is another example. This is the Beirut explosion. And this was uh, two weeks afterwards. Now, as a USAR technician, and a former SBCA inspector, um, looking at that cat, that doesn't look like it's been um, trapped or it's emaciated or whatever. It just looks like a stray cat. But here in this photo, it's been used as part of the campaign about helping animals from the Be Beirut explosion. It's a pre-existing condition that's been purported to be linked to the Beirut expl explosion. It was a stray cat two weeks after, Ch chances are it was a stray cat two weeks prior. Then we go to the bushfires. Now, Bill Slade uh, was a veteran 40-year wildland firefighter, and he was killed by a tree in Victoria during the bushfires, um, the Black, Black Summer bushfires. Whether it's active or post-active, fire ground, like we're seeing here, trees fall over. The fire usually decimates the roots, the base of the tree. And you can see here examples of this. Branches falling around and not having basic PPE. Another example. All we have here is I asked the question, what skills does an organization bring to these responses that can't be fulfilled by local capacity? There's no PPE, there's no ladders, there's no resources. Again, we've got cotton t-shirts and I can assure you, um, having been involved in responses like this and as a uh, qualified wildland firefighter, even though you'll have areas that are no longer an active fire ground, there will still be embers which burn for days, weeks, even months. So tripping over and ending up in a pit full of uh, hot embers is a real threat in these environments. But this is probably the most concerning. This is the one that probably caused me the, the need to really sort of speak up about, about this because there is no doubt in the video where I've taken the still from, you could see the flames. And having someone with no PPE, with no helmet, no gloves, no uh, flame retardant overalls, or even just cotton coveralls, this is why you can see why emergency services may be reluctant to engage us. We seek legitimacy. We seek um, dispensation from the general public to go into these high-risk areas to help animals. But this is probably encapsulates the delegitimization of animal rescue. But it can be done. Here's a great example from, I don't know the exact uh, name of the organization, but one of them at least is from a wildlife rescue organization. And look, they've got the right PPE, the right equipment. That's what emergency services are looking for. Again here, getting the right PPE, even if you're traveling internationally, you're gonna procure locally, getting the right PPE before you head off is really important because the health and safety laws still apply. 
And in Australia in particular, the laws are quite tough. And I can just imagine what would happen if the WorkSafe, the, 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 uh, the Occupational Health and Safety Regulator was to investigate some of these responses, that some of the responses would be wanting. But another good example is here the Humane Society of the US. They've done a great job, look at this. This is the level of equipment and PPE and capacity you, you need. I assume if they're wearing all that kit, they've also got all the right training. But when you turn up with the right kit on, the right costume, people take you seriously. If you turn up wearing a t-shirt and a pair of beach boy pants, no one's gonna take you seriously. But when you turn up to incidents like this and you've got your dry suit, your helmet, your PFD, you look the part, it look, you look credible, you create trust. So let's look at some recommendations moving, moving forward. One of the biggest ch challenges is that if we look at even today's group, our audience, I would dare say that the bulk of us, if not all, are already a converted audience. We already think that animals are important. The trouble is the mainstream systems don't recognize us as, as well as they should. So there's little point for us as a group of convinced individuals to come together to form sort of groups to promote what we're doing if we're just talking to the converted. So within Australasia, what I would suggest is that AFAC, the Australasian Fire Authorities Council, they are the ones that form an animal disaster management working group. With earthquake rescues, the UN has a system called INSERAG, the International Search and Rescue Advisory Group. They even have search marking systems and team accreditation. But those marking systems are not suitable or authorized to be used for animal rescues, and that's created issues. If we, have, if we use existing mainstream mechanisms, such as INSERAG, we get organizations like INSERAG to include animal search markings, to include light team accreditation. We will ensure that the right team that's got the right training, the right equipment can be mobilized. Now there are some good examples where this mainstreaming has been successful. FEMA, for example, brought in animal response team typing across a wide variety of skill sets. They've done that, and that's run by FEMA, not by an animal welfare organization or an association of those interested in animal welfare, but the federal agency responsible. Likewise, standards, the National Fire Protection Association. I think I may actually have that number wrong. I think it's 150, and I know that Rebecca will tell me exactly because she's been on that working group, which is the standard for animal accommodation and housing. Making sure that the fire standards are driven by, for animals, are driven by the same body that drives the human standards. Animal rescue is an NFPA chapter for animal rescue. I helped that being developed with John Haven, who used to be with University of Florida. I think he's actually still there, or well, somewhere along those lines. And AIMS, we've got to make sure that the incident management system includes animals. And those examples that we've seen through NFPA um, 150, 116, 70, but also in the UK, Jim Green's discussion of having one, a tactical advisor for animal rescue on staff, and also in Australia, the piloting of in New South Wales, the technical advisor for wildlife having a direct report to the incident commander or, or controller are ways that are legitimizing the role for animal disaster management. I know in New Zealand, the rescue of animals sits under animal welfare, which is a welfare function. But actually, the rescue of animals is an operational function. The fire services should be leading that. 
with the support of animal agencies and departments. Because we've got to ensure there's an integrated response. There is no point having a animal rescue team going door to door and we've got human rescue teams going door to door, going to the same place at different times. If we use the same credentials, the same training as the human responders, then the animal response uh, responders can act as a force multiplier. We can add extra capacity. We can add extra surge capacity, train to the same level, the same equipment to go out there and expedite general search and rescue within, an, within a disaster affected area. If they are separate, then we're basically duplicating search, um, we're duplicating the search efforts. But we need a way, and this was touched on with the AgPass presentation, we need a way to ensure the validation of those training credentials. So ITRA, the International Technical Rescue Association has a system which includes QR codes, which allow for training to be validated in real time, which means even if you've lost your ID, you can present it on your, on your phone. But we need to step up as, as an industry. I was lucky enough to hear from Dr. Arnie Goldman at the NACEP 2019 conference, and he spoke about the Certified Emergency Management Program and encouraged more veterinary and animal disaster response people to get that credential. Because I dare say, yes, in this room, we've probably got lots of people with animal and veterinary related qualifications, but what emergency management qualifications do they have to be credible at the table with the emergency managers that are often leading these operations? Now, the integrated human uh, animal rescue response I've sort of spoken about um, sort of prior. But you'll see to the, to the right hand side a picture of what was called the USAR Orange Card in New Zealand. And this was an incident ground certification card that said if you had completed some compulsory training in ICS, some urban search and rescue and first aid, you were eligible for that card and it had a photo ID. And that was something that we developed when I was at the Ministry of Civil Defence and Emergency Management in response to the Oklahoma bombing, where media were going to local firehouses and taking turnout uh, uniforms, wearing those into the, um, into the disaster or the, into the hot zone um, so they could get footage. So having some form of identification is really important. Now I'll come back to lessons management. If you respond, I will, I want you to ask the question yourself, are you accountable and to whom? Who are you accountable for? Do we have a code of conduct? Is there a code of conduct? We probably need a code of conduct. And I know that organizations like NASI in the US, they do have a code of conduct, but we don't have anything globally. And we're starting to see more internationalization, internationalization of animal disaster response. If you are going to response, just like these INSERAG accredited teams, you have to do an after action report. But what's the point of these reports if they're not being shared? And often they're lost, they're buried. So this is where I would recommend to all of you that you do a lessons or an after action report for all your responses. And you can protect that information by registering it with your national library service. And through that it can be issued a ISBN number. And that legally protects that document. It cannot be deleted. It cannot be uh, buried. It is there for others to see. And one of the things that we're doing as part of GADMAC is developing a global lessons uh, Lesson, uh, global lessons management system for animal disaster response called GLADIS. So hopefully in a period of time, we'll be encouraging you all to send in your after action report so we've got an online database. So when you do get a response, you can go to that database and pull up the lessons of the past to ensure that we're not making the same mistakes, which often affect the welfare of animals and also the safety of people. 
But I do come back to what will you bring to the table that local capacity is unable to? And often local community members, and I've seen this in other responses, local communities can often get upset that you as an animal response organisation has been allowed into the area, but they are not. But yet they've got the local knowledge, they've got the rapport with the animal, but they're not necessarily qualified. And if you're not qualified, what are you bringing to the table that they can't already do? We're disempowering communities unless we can encourage them to um, be part of these, these sort of plans. So from here, I'm just gonna be um, a couple of final points. The key thing is that as epic as it may have looked on TV, um, let us not end up with a trail of disappointment or ruin it for others. If we go into a deployment and we go into an area and then we leave, other organizations still have to continue often in that area. We have to pave the way that their relationships are not deteriorated by our actions. Because if we are going in and doing harm and disempowering communities, and not stepping up to the plate with the right training and equipment, it makes it hard for everyone. It makes it hard for everyone in this conference because we unfortunately get delegitimized. We are seen as not professional. We are, as, as uh, Rebecca said, those animal crazies. We have to be professional. We have to have the equipment and we've got to step up and that means stepping up before the event. So we don't want to have um, we want to have a good sequel, uh, not a bad sequel like the, the Blues Brothers ended up with. So that's my discussion for today. And I'm really looking forward to your, your comments. I'm sure there'll be some lively debate. And that is the purpose of today, having this challenging conversation. So looking at some of the... Oh, sorry. Speak, let me, just let me ha have a yeah, word sure. before you get going. Um, so I just really want to say thank you to Steve for the presentation, for hopefully winding us all up a little bit. Um, and I do want to jump in quickly with a question because it was made by somebody in the audience and it was the one I wanted to ask as well. So I'm going to kick off anyway, regardless of what you're doing. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you about the media. Um, Julie makes a point about the media being a big culprit in this. And it's something that frustrates the heck out of me as well, that we get pictures of people running in to rescue koalas with taking their shirts off and that gets played and played again and everybody says what a great hero that person is um, and therefore how can we ever expect to move on if that's what our media is doing um, and promulgating to the general public who then want to do something and, and it's understandable we want to do something so I'm not criticizing the desire to want to do something mm. It's that, well, that. I think I think the reality is that we we all know that this area is under underfunded. Nobody wants to put money into it until there's a response, and so there is some, uh, you know, moral dilemma that you have to, in some ways, use the response to generate interest and funds because it's not funded out of it's not funded in peacetime sufficiently. So I accept that as as a reality, but a lot of the times this footage is being provided by the very agencies. Uh, involved. Because if you're in the middle of a fire in the middle of nowhere, the only way that footage is going to get out or even be taken is by those very agencies. So I think there needs to be um, better control of images that are being shared. Because if you're prepared to send anything out to the internet and put it online, you've got to be held accountable for it. So if you're prepared to put all your photos of, of untrained, unequipped volunteers running around an active fire ground, then you've got to be able to accept the accountability that comes along with that. Of course, just, just a, a follow up. It's not always just the um, spontaneous responders that do that. I mean, there are quite a lot of formal response agencies mm. who don't have responsibility for animals who like to put stuff on social media, which, which you know, shows their people rescuing animals, which of course is wonderful on one hand, but it does create an expectation of the public that the emergency responders are doing this sort of stuff when really that's not their role or responsibility. And this is where it comes back to mainstreaming, that they're having that technical advisor in the incident management team means that as public information is being made available, they should be checking. Um, we often see reinforcing of poor behaviors in flooding incidents. We see 
kids play, playing in flood water like it's some sort of great new pool and it's exciting. They don't, um, and so we know that sometimes we're conveying or portraying emergencies you know, incorrectly. So I think we've all got a collective responsibility that what we share and what your members share, even on their own private social media, needs to be vetted. There needs to be some ground rules with that. Now, yes, the media may turn up with their cameras and take photos, but I dare, dare suggest, don't put yourself in that position where they're gonna take photos of you looking unprofessional and unequipped, because that is going to, that is going to circulate. So again, if you wanna to come to the game on Saturday, come to practice on Wednesday and be part of the plan before the event. Shall I go through the next question, Smell? Yeah, 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 I know you wanted to answer the questions yourself, so you go for no, it. No, that's all, that's all good. Um, from Chris, as a recently retired Regional Emergency Management Director, um, I totally endorse the need to embed animal planning in the structure of the overall disaster plan. This is going to need to be actively promoted by all professional animal-focused organisations through building relationships with their local emergency management author uh, authorities. Very good point, Chris, and I, I agree hard, hold, hard um, hold full heartedly or whatever it is. Um, totally agree. Um, and I know that you've been a great advocate uh, for that um, in New Zealand. So thanks for your endeavours. We need more champions like you. I think that's probably a good example about the mainstreaming. It's not the animal person pushing the issue. It's the, it's the director of emergency management pushing the issue. So thank you for your, your contributions. Um, and yes, another, uh, there's an anonymous one here saying animals caught in disaster deserve that the game be lifted and not just used for, for raising funds or forcing agendas. I'm sure that's, uh, that's an exciting uh, comment. Um, and um, Amanda's got a, another um, great point. She said, look, where appropriate, there are some animals and disasters knowledge and lessons that can be stored on the ARDR Knowledge Hub. Uh, it's free to in anyone. I totally agree. Um, and I suppose the idea of Gladys um, was the G, was the global. So, and it's specific to um, you know, animal disaster management as well. So we can start build, develop that building of, um, uh, of capacity and, and knowledge. Oh, I think I just um, answered one that I shouldn't have. I oh, know, I think we're all, we're all good on that one. Uh, that is done. So, just reading a few of these things. Um, the great importance of owning the space and peacetime so that professional response is ready is absolutely critical. Um, to Mel's comment, this is the only way we intercept uh, inappropriate media responses where disasters can be predicted. Message, messaging can also be predicted and planned for. Um, here we go, another one from um, some one of our listeners. Um, often we meet problems with animal welfare associations who often use media to communicate and obtain money. And, in, and this is the increasing reality. Now doing so, um, rescue with them, we signed a contract to ensure there's no bad communication. And look, this comes back down to this whole planning. If you wanna to come to the game on Saturday, where were you on Wednesday? There should be an MOU. And I know that in New Zealand, um, organizations have been pushing for over two years now for an MOU. We're still waiting for that. Um, it's that kind of um, leadership that needs to be demonstrated by central government, in New Zealand's case, to ensure that these MOUs in place. So we do have some ground rules and we do have a code of conduct. So great point there. Media training, uh, Liddell was mentioning about media training is really important. Totally agree. Again, this is emergency management 101. So if you're coming in from the EM perspective, sorry, if you're coming in from the animal perspective, you actually need to learn more about emergency management. Um, a, a base degree in animal science, veterinary um, is one thing, but you actually need to learn both. If you really want to master this, this area, you need to have experience across both, both industries because you'll learn about incident command, you'll learn about um, coordination systems and plans, and that includes how media is managed. And again, if everyone's part of the plan and part of the emergency operations centre, that will lead to a coordinated approach to public information. Um, 
Right, fire crews are trolling the social media for the rogue responders. Um, yes. Um, so I think this is a key thing, that we need those MOUs, we need government, we need the legitimization of bona fide organisations being in plans, so that the emergency management directors, the controllers, can clearly state, we work with the following organisations, they are part of our plan. And by saying that, it's saying the others aren't part of it. They are the Winn-Dixies, they are the rogue element, and they are the ones that are likely to put themselves and others at risk. But it's not just the, the, rogue, uh, the rogue spontaneous volunteers. Um, the image setting and the trust building is also for well-established organizations because the majority of these organizations that do a form of response they do many other things during peacetime, and then they also respond. And that makes it difficult because if you're an animal welfare organization and you're advocating for, you're advocating against factory farming, against animals in laboratories, do you really think those, those, um, those owners or guardians of those animals during disaster want your help? Chances are no. And I know that in the, in the Edgecombe flood, um, people purposefully um, uh, sought help not going through the local SPCA because they had a compliance history. So sometimes you need organisations that are neutral, that don't have that compliance history, that don't have the animal rights agenda because ultimately, how do those animals get assistance if, if the organisation doesn't trust who's coming? Um, Gerardo said, do no harm ought to extend to assuring baseline animal welfare is not adding to the vulnerability of animals in the next round, which means disaster risk reduction is the long game. And again, you just can't turn up on the day. You've got to find out ways to how you can work with recovery and ensure that we're building back better. And Julie says, thanks for the discussion. We are really all in this together. So back to you, Mel, I've run out of steam. No, Steve, I want you just to take a look at the chat because a few of the panellists oh. um, aren't able to actually put questions into of the Of course, I'm glad you, um, let me just uh, find the magical witchcraft on chat. It's not going to get off lightly. Oh, oh yes, it was, it was a hidden one. Oh dear, okay, I see what you mean. Um, yes, there was scammers around uh, during social media. Yep. I totally agree. Um, and this is where it comes back to the emergency plan. If the officials are going out there saying, these are the following organisations that are approved, are trained and capable of actually helping animals in disasters. And if you want to make a donation, these are the only organisations that are officially integrated. Now this is done often in aid situations. In New Zealand, the New Zealand Aid Programme has specific accreditation to be approved and eligible for funding. So again, we can do this under our emergency management plans, is that if you're in the plan, there should be arrangements also for funding. I know that in one circumstance, the plans and MOUs can actually cause harm. I'll give you an example. In one state, there was a situation where a large animal welfare organisation had essentially a contract to provide response services when activated, which meant, from what I understand, they wouldn't respond until they were asked, which meant that there was a gap until they got asked because they wouldn't respond until they were gonna get paid. But then when they responded, they then started their own social media campaign and fundraising. And it's like, well, hang on, if you've been funded by the state to do this response, why do you need to fundraise at the, at the expense of other organisations that are filling the gaps. So there are some issues around um, MOUs that need to be um, considered. Um, the equality for anim, uh, animal human disease outbreaks is, is, um, is really important as Ian Dake has noted and as part of the One Health approach. Um, and yes, the, the Gladys database will be free and we'll be able to um, encourage you all to subscribe to that so you can submit and share your after action reports. Um, 
In terms of local capacity, um, there's some really good um, questions around that. Um, I'll give you an example. Animal EVAC is not a team of 12 people or whatever. It uses the model that there's actually people that have got these skills already in the community. And that's how they've managed to build a network of over 300 people throughout the country. They've got vets. They've got more vets than any other disaster response team in the country. More vet nurses, more vet techs. They have emergency managers. They've got firefighters, they've got paramedics, they've got administrators similar to what Savem has done. But the idea is that these people are actually throughout the whole of the country and they become ambassadors for speaking to their local community, engaging their local community to have communities get prepared. So they're not reliant on any central, um, central um, uh, response. Um, I may just sort of stop there, Mel. Is there things that you want me to prioritize in terms of that chat, because I, I'm conscious of time? and I'd, I'd rather you um, uh, triage what you feel is appropriate. No, I think we're probably about there. There's a question about the Gladys idea and whether that will be something that would be available, freely available and accessible. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, the concept, I've done some testing, um, it is about sort of 90% there. Um, and um, the idea, excuse me, is that will become embedded um, on the uh, GADMAC website. So, um, People can easily come in and, and access uh, access that. Um, if anyone is a guru in um, the database NAC and website stuff, and they want to do some pro bono to help this project, please let me know, and I'm happy to exploit your skills and time. Great, thanks, Steve. I mean, we've got a couple of other comments about, for example, this idea about not being able to actually deploy until activated. And I know it, I know it is an issue for a number of groups and organisations in official capacities. So, again, it's something that you know, until there's a problem, you can't actually do something. And of course, in the meantime, people want to jump into that vacuum. So, I think that's always going to be an issue we need to sort of consider. Okay, I'm going to wrap it up now. Um, I've given you some extra time because um, because of who you are. Special dispensation there. Um, but thank you so much, Steve, for um, causing some lively debate on the Q&A. It was really active and our speakers, uh, previous speakers who are in the panel area at the moment, uh, that the, the chat there is going kind of pretty crazy too. Um, so for our um, next session, it's going to be uh, the start of day 10 for us here in Australia and New Zealand. So um, we have a presentation from Dr. Saskia van Manen from the Netherlands in the morning, uh, our time. And she's going to be talking about animals as integral aspects of public communication before, during and after emergencies, which sounds extremely useful um, and relevant to the conversations that we've been having here this afternoon um, or in this session. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you for the final day of GADMAC tomorrow. Bye bye. <laughs>